John Mundell has been uh, an incredible friend of the Acton Institute from before we began. So I need to tell you this right off the bat, that uh, in 1990, when Chris came uh, to uh, uh, Grand Rapids to begin the work of the Institute, we immediately sent him to Washington, D.C., just to understand how you put together a think tank, because we knew nothing about how one does this kind of thing. And um, he went to Washington, and uh, I think he was staying in Virginia, and one of the places he was uh, looking at was the Institute for Humane Studies, near, at that time, near uh, George Mason University, where he met John Blundell. Now, John is an old... Um, <coughs> war horse and the cause of liberty. He uh, was the president then of the Institute for Humane Studies. He also served as this, he is serving now as the distinguished sen senior fellow for the Institute of Economic Affairs. But at the time, uh, he was at the Institute for Humane Studies, and I think also at that time uh, working with Atlas at that time. And Chris went to him and explained to him our vision of beginning the Acton Institute. Uh, John was so taken by the vision that he actually wrote a letter to his supporters asking for them to support the Acton Institute, which was at that time simply an idea. At that time, we didn't even have a brochure. <laughs> we didn't, we had, I, I'm not even sure Chris had the apartment at the flower shop on Crescent <laughs> uh, Avenue at the time. And, but that's how uh, John viewed it, the power of ideas and really an entrepreneur of ideas. Uh, he has served in many different capacities, again, promoting uh, an understanding of uh, liberty the Institute for Humane Studies, as I mentioned, the Atlas Economic Research Foundation, the Charles Koch Foundation. He was also, as I say, instrumental in the founding of the Acton Institute. He is a Brit, as you will see uh, two seconds after he opens his mouth. Uh, we've been friends for, for many, many years, and he is the author of several books, uh, Ladies for Liberty, and then the book that he will be addressing himself to today, uh, Margaret Thatcher, A Portrait of the Iron Lady. Mm -hmm. Following the lecture, you'll have an opportunity to uh, obtain a copy of that if you like and, and get an autographed copy as well. So please join me in welcoming uh, John Blundell. Thank you, uh, Father Robert. Um, it's very interesting being in here uh, this, this time with this art prize, uh, which um, is dominating everything in, in, in your city. And I'm very interested in it because I, I, I once placed a second in, in, in an art prize in, in England. Uh, in London, we have the famous uh, Turner Prize uh, for, for art. And um, the Chelsea College of Art, in a rather cheeky manner, runs the Turn Up Prize <laughs> for people who are not artists. And what happens is you turn up, you explain your art artistic idea to the uh, dean of the, uh, of the school, and he assigns you to an artist student, <coughs> and you work as a team. You explain your artistic idea, and the student works on it, and then you enter as a team. And the first year that was run, about 10 years ago now, I placed second. <laughs> <laughs> Very proud of that. I'm delighted to be here. It's my first ever visit to the Acton Institute. I've been to uh, many events in Pittsburgh, Florida, and England, and all kinds of places um, with uh, Father Robert over the years. He actually missed out part of the story, because I was also in Antigua uh, when you and Alex Shafflin were first hatching the idea uh, for the uh, Acton Institute. And you also missed the trick, Father, in that um, uh, when I wrote that letter to my 250 top donors, uh, the first one to respond with the first check, I believe, was J.P. Humphreys of Tanco Asphalt Products in Joplin, Missouri, whose son, his name is just up, up there, because this is the Humphreys boardroom. Mm -hmm. And David Humphreys, um, I believe, serves on your board, or did? He's the chairman. Chairman of the, chairman of the board. So that, that link continues. Um, 
I'm very pleased, and I was mentioning this when I was interviewed on, on the radio, local radio station yesterday afternoon, I don't know if any of you have heard that, um, that you're awarding your Faith and Freedom Prize uh, on October 20th to Lady Thatcher. Uh, of course, she uh, can't be here. Um, she's sending uh, John O'Sullivan, a great friend of mine, uh, who was a great uh, supporter and speechwriter for her in the 1980s, um, to pick up the, um, the prize. Uh, the last time I had lunch with her back uh, last spring at the Ritz in London, um, uh, she was um, not really tuned in anymore. It was rather hard work. And as her daughter Carol has said uh, publicly in the press, uh, that after f four years as leader of her party and 11 and a half years as Prime Minister, it's not surprising that she's blown a few gaskets. <laughs> uh, that's the actual quote. <laughs> in fact, she turns 86. Uh, next uh, Thursday, October the 13th. Um, let me just say a word about how I came to write the two books that Father Robert uh, mentioned. Um, about five years ago, the Heritage Foundation had me address uh, their resource bank out in Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, on Lady Thatcher. And the audience there um, greeted my remarks so incredibly positive, such an incredibly positive, probably the, the, one of the top three speeches I ever made in terms of audience response to what I was saying. And I thought, this is amazing. And I sat down uh, the following summer uh, at my cabin in West Virginia, and I wrote um, Margaret Thatcher, A Portrait of the Iron Lady, which is what I'm going to speak about today. But that led to speaking engagements all around the States, and I still do speak, as I'm speaking today, obviously, on, on this book. Um, speaking engagements around the States, which the first or second or third question from the floor would inevitably be, why didn't we have more Margaret Thatchers in our history? And I'd be quite shocked by this question, because I reply, well, American history is stuffed with really good women. I mean, if you look at Italian, French, German, Austrian, even English, <laughs> Swedish, Spanish, Portuguese history, I mean, you struggle to find uh, women who are uh, uh, even allowed to, to play uh, even a minor role. In, in, in the battle for liberty, even in England. And I would mention Abigail Adams, Martha Washington, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Ayn Rand, and lots and lots of heads would nod. But as soon as I got off those three or four, I was, the, the recognition just fell into the cellar. Um, when I mentioned uh, Bina West Miller of Port Huron, Michigan. Does anybody know that name? See, yeah, Michigan, not a single person knows Bina West Miller. She invented life insurance for women, which was an astonishing breakthrough of the, back in the 1880s. Or well, Sojourner Truth. A few there, yeah, but do you know where she's buried? Battle Creek. Battle Creek. And the gravestone is about 20 years off. She was about 86, not 106. <laughs> um, and she reassembled her whole family there. When, when I got into names like this, or even Mercy Otis Warren, uh, people, who was the conscience, she was clearly the most important person in the American Revolution, and, and her nickname was Conscience of the Revolution. Um, name recognition was down in the cellar. And I would come back off these speaking tours, uh, kvetching and moaning about this, and uh, you know how respectful 18 and 19 year old children can be to their parents. Um, <laughs> one evening uh, at a Chinese restaurant in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, my then, I think, 19 year old turned to me and he said, for heaven's sakes, Dad, Shut up. <laughs> Stop moaning and write a book about them all. <laughs> and that's this book, which, um, which is also available afterward. Uh, Ladies for Liberty, um, Women Who Made a Difference in American History. So there is a link between, and my e economist friends in England think it's uh, absolutely hilarious that Blundell is writing women's history. <laughs> but women's history from a pro-liberty uh, point of view. Now, in the run-up to October 20th, and you're awarding your Faith and Freedom Award to Lady Thatcher, I've been asked to <coughs> talk about her, her ide ideas, and what we can learn from her today. First, her ascent. She was born in 1925 in a small market town called Grantham in Lincolnshire, which was on the east coast, the eastern side of the UK. Self-employment dominates her family tree way back, for, as far as we can trace, about four or five generations on, on both sides. Nothing but self-employment. She was the second daughter of Alf Roberts, and Alf ran the local grocer's shop. He was a pillar of the community. He held every conceivable civic 
posts from councilman to alderman to mayor, even during World War II, air raid precaution warden. Um, now he'd left school at age 12, uh, but he was known as the most learned man in town. And every week, uh, Margaret and, and Alf would go to the local library and come back with armloads of books. The house had no bath, uh, no running hot water, uh, no TV, of course, and, and no radio, but dozens of books. And adult conversation at all meals was, was, was expected. Uh, there was a movie house um, which uh, opened her eyes to the outside world. Uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, uh, was an early favorite of hers, and her father also introduced her to the writings of Walt Whitman. Now, in World War II, uh, the United States Air Force uh, came to those flat lands of eastern England for two reasons. One, they were flat and they could easily build uh, runways uh, for the B-52 bombers. And secondly, the eastern side of England, of course, was closer to Germany uh, and that would make the trip either shorter or they could get deeper into enemy territory. And so all these United States Air Force bases opened up. And that this raised um, public policy issues that Margaret would have heard uh, discussed as, as a young girl. Uh, Sundays in those days were um, um, sacred. I mean, nothing opened on Sunday, Not, nothing at all. Even, even the park, the gates to the local park were locked on a Sunday. Um, but Alf, as uh, a leading uh, mayor at the time, uh, str struggled with um, what to do. It seemed unfair that some of the rotation, the, that these, these servicemen would have time off on a Sunday. And um, he had to choose between either opening the park or allowing the movie house to open. And he allowed the movie house to open on the grounds so that would be less disruptive than young American men throwing a ball around in the, in, in the, in the park. <laughs> she walked to school, uh, past the dole queues of the late 30s, past bomb damage in the early 40s because her town had a munitions factory that was often targeted by the German bombers. She was so bright, she skipped a, a year at school and she aimed for chemistry at Oxford, uh, which was a enormous reach for a, a, a working class girl from a small provincial uh, town. Um, she um, did four years at Oxford, she made it to Oxford. Um, she had to have Latin to study o chemistry at Oxford in those days. And her school didn't even have a Latin teacher. Because, um, you know, well, nobody expected girls from small provincial towns to go to Oxbridge. Um, so her father dipped into his savings, hired the Latin teacher from the boys' school, and in six months flat, she did seven years of, of, of Latin. Uh, she volunteered two nights a, a week um, at um, the local uh, United States Air Force Base outside of Oxford, bussing tables. And um, she, um, the, the union, the famous Oxford Union Debating Society was closed to women. Um, they could sit up in the gods and watch the men, but they couldn't participate on the floor. Uh, not until the mid-60s, in fact. And um, so she um, threw all her energies into the Oxford University Conservative Association and became its second ever lady president. Uh, but she was the first who made it purely on merit because the lady who just beat her to that job, um, I think her father served in Churchill's cabinet or some such connection, so she could guarantee lots of good speakers, as Margaret had no such connections. And she drove membership over a 1,000 uh, for the first time in, 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 in decades. Um, she got a job in industry after the war, after graduating and the war had ended. Uh, she worked on the um, development of, is it called Cool Whip? Is, it, is, is, there, is that a product? Yeah. Yeah. Something in a can you press and something white comes out of it? Yeah. Uh, uh, she, she worked on the early development of that as a chemist. She was adopted um, for Dartford in Kent uh, to fight the 1950 and 51 elections. She was the, um, I think, not only the, the youngest woman uh, candidate um, uh, for those, uh, the, the youngest candidate period. And Dartford was a very safe socialist seat and the chairman of the association had been very impressed with her at, at a meeting of the Conservative Party conference and he thought, we'll have a bit of fun, because Dartford was just outside of London and they did indeed get national, even international, attention for this rather um, aggressive young lady. She married a local businessman down in Dartford, uh, Dennis, 10 years her senior, who had a quite a prosperous uh, oil and paint business. And um, she immediately produced twins, uh, Mark and Carol. And it was while she was in hospital recovering from uh, the birth of the twins that, that she decided to switch career and become a barrister. That is a, 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 an attorney who appears in court. We, we don't have attorneys, we have solicitors 
there are the people who do you know, house conveyancing, wills, and all that stuff, and all the preparatory stuff. But if you want to be the person that stands up in court, um, then you're a, a barrister. And, and she trained to be a tax barrister. Uh, toward the end of the, she sat out the 55 election, found it very frustrating. And as the 59 election approached, um, she decided that she was really entitled, having, having put up a good fight twice in the early 50s, to a safe seat, and she started applying. But she always came second for about 18 months. She never came second. And it was always because the women opposed her. It was the women in the Conservative parties uh, on the selection committees who um, wanted a, a, a nice uh, young man who'd had a good war, if there was such a thing, uh, a few medals, you know, a captain or a commander or a wing, wing commander or whatever, uh, a pretty stay-at-home wife and two and a half children. Um, that, that was what their, their, their vision was. And this rather pushy chemist turned barrister who, who'd uh, had twins but they were uh, looked after by a team of uh, au pairs and nannies at home uh, while she was out there fighting court cases uh, didn't really fit their model. But she finally um, broke through Finchley in North London, um, <coughs> where she was elected in 59 and re-elected every single time up until 1992 when she retired and took a seat in the House of Lords. And I think from 59 onward, being a lady uh, helped her. Um, as Ted Heath famously said in 1970, uh, as it's recorded in the memoirs of one of his colleagues, uh, when Heath won the 70 election and was forming his cabinet, he turned to Jim Pryor and he said, well, Jim, who's going to be our statutory woman then? I guess it better be Margaret. Um, so she got preferment um, a little faster than might otherwise be the case. But I mean, obviously, there was a lot of merit there, but it certainly helped. So what was the state of the UK when she won? Well, we'd just gone through the winter of 1979, January, February, March 1979, and it was called the winter of discontent, as in the opening line of Shakespeare's Richard III. Now is the winter of our discontent. We'd had double-digit inflation for six years. It averaged 16% and once hit 30%. Gas supplies were disrupted, there were pickets all over the place, a million people had been laid off because of industrial action. Ambulances stopped responding to 911 calls. Can you imagine? There were mountains of trash, all those famous London squares were piled high, I mean 20, 30 feet high because the, um, the, the trashmen were on strike. The gravediggers were on strike. And coffins, full coffins, were mounting up in empty factories. And um, uh, the chief medical officer was about to, all of them all, about to order mass burials at sea. The, um, there were food shortages. The hospital union leaders were deciding who to admit to hospital, not the doctors. And if uh, somebody died, as one leader, union leader put it, well, so be it. Trolleys of food to old people's homes were smashed, and British Rails, then still a nationalised company, issued the shortest press release in PR history. It read, there are no trains today. That was it. <laughs> so she became the fourth ever elected lady leader, but the first in the West. The other three, of course, were Mrs. Bandra Naika in, in Sri Lanka, Indra Gandhi in India, and Gilda Meir in Israel. But she was the first in, in, in the West, and she inherited an economy that was 19th out of 22 in the OECD. And the French ambassador said we suffered from degringolade, which is French for falling down sickness, like the stick man falling down the staircase. And the West German, because Germany wasn't united at that, that time, the West German ambassador uh, said we had the economy of East Germany. That was a pretty insulting uh, thing, thing to say. Um, so what did she do? In my book, um, I summarize um, her legacy as follows. She took on the whole trade union movement and through her reforms gave it back, the trade unions back to their members rather than to the extremists. She transformed the nation's view of the benefits of a market-based economy. She privatized the commanding heights of the economy, which had been nationalized by Attlee after World War II, which led to enormous Im improvements in industries. Virtually anything that started with the word British was nationalized. And um, British Airways, British Gas, British Rail, and, and so on and so forth. She taught us the need for monetary continents uh, if we wish to control inflation. She enfranchised millions of 
former local authority, local city serfs who had been living in city-provided housing uh, by giving them the right to buy it, which transformed those housing units, by the way. She made Brits uh, walk tall again with a firm and principled approach to the international rule of law. Uh, she cut tax rates from the 90s to the 80s to the 60s and down to the 40s, still very high, but that stopped the brain drain and the fame drain, and some people even came back. Uh, she started the process which has now led to peace in Northern Ireland. She helped Ronald Reagan tear down that wall without a shot being fired. I should say she helped Ronald Reagan and the Pope to tear down that wall. Sorry. <laughs> and she ensured that all uh, future uh, British governments would have to be much friendlier uh, toward uh, the kinds of ideas that uh, uh, this institute stands for um, if they wish to succeed. So what happened? Well, Britain leapt from 19th to 2nd on the OECD letter. Uh, it became a no nation of entrepreneurs with self-employment, which I think is a very good measure of entrepreneurship, doubling from 7% uh, to 14%. Uh, when she came um, to power uh, in 1979, uh, the UK did not have a um, venture capital industry. Uh, six years later, our venture capital industry was twice the size of the venture capital industry in the entire continent of Europe. Uh, the group that we call middle class, as measured by sociologists and the like, leapt from 33% to 50% <coughs> of the population. Home ownership, as opposed to renting or living as a local authority tenant, um, home ownership uh, jumped from 53% to 71%. Huge jumps, huge movements. Ownerships of shares, and by this I, I don't mean where you've not a, got a clue what's you know, standard life or whoever put in your pension pot, uh, what they're buying, uh, but where you personally decide I'm going to buy some stock in the XYZ company. Uh, only 7% of us were stock owners in 79, and by the time she left, it was close to 30%. And the percentage of people uh, belonging to a trade union, the percentage of the workforce belonging to a trade union, had plummeted from over 50% to less than 20%, and the number of days lost to strikes had gone from 30 million days a year to virtually none about half a million, and that those half a million were pretty much um, um, concentrated in one industry, and it was the one industry that she <coughs> failed to pri privatise, namely the post office, and she failed because the Queen was unhappy at the thought that her image would not appear on every stamp, <laughs> so the rumour goes. The, transform the transformation was stunning, and even the left-leaning BBC, institutionally left-leaning BBC, was forced to add business reporters. Before Thatcher, they had half a business report, one person who was half-time as a business reporter. Uh, by the time she left, uh, th th there was whole teams of business reporters because now so many people were now in business for themselves, so many people now in stock, so many people own their own home. Uh, it, it was a complete um, transformation. So what are my um, ten lessons, some of which uh, might uh, be helpful um, today. Before I get into them, I, I would appreciate a glass of water if somebody could provide it, please. And these aren't in any particular order. I, I think um, we have to start, though, with thank you so much. <coughs> We have to start with probably the reason you're honouring her on October the 20th, that she had a very strong moral and political compass. Um, she knew where she wanted to go, she knew what needed doing, and she, um, it, it, as far as, it, it wasn't the bossiness of the cartoons at the time, um, so much as uh, con conviction, and it built very good um, teamwork. Um, she displayed an awful lot of courage uh, when the Iranian embassy siege early in her time as, as Prime Minister, when she ordered 
the crack uh, military unit, the SAS, to go in uh, and take out the, um, the terrorists. Uh, this, was, this was new to Brits. I mean, they weren't used to prime ministers being sort of so firm and decisive and, <laughs> and clear cut. They were used to, you know, the model of the middle, uh, people prevaricating. Um, she was able also to cut through the gut. Secondly, she was able to cut through the guff and the nonsense and speak very directly. I, I, every time I see Newt Gingrich, I'm reminded of her because Newt and Margaret are both people that don't say at this moment in time. They say now. You know, they use short Anglo-Saxon words to express uh, what they're, they're thinking and what they want to do. Uh, Margaret once said to a friend of mine, Simon Jenkins, one of our most prominent uh, journalists, uh, he used the phrase uh, laissez-faire instead of free market. And she said, uh, Simon, laissez-faire, laissez-faire, don't you go French on me. <laughs> She's a very clever person. I mean, you don't get from her humble origins to Oxford to do chemistry and get a very good degree, by the way, and then become a tax barrister without being clever. But she's, unlike most seriously clever people, she has this knack of simplifying and c communicating. She did lead, and she expected, thirdly, um, and she expected a lot of out, out, out of people around her. Um, I'll tell you uh, two stories. The first one I told on the radio yesterday, if any of you listened uh, in, um, th and it's true. Uh, the second one is not true, but is illustrative. The first one is, um, concerns two friends of mine, David and Michael. David had been, D Michael had been elected to Parliament in 83, uh, David had been elected to Parliament in 87, and by the time David got there in 87, Michael was a junior minister. And on David's first day in Parliament, he's going through the members' lobby, not the central lobby, the members' lobby, where only members of Parliament can go. And he saw Michael running, with his hair all awry, and a bulging briefcase, and a pile of files under his arm that were in danger of cascading down to the floor. And so uh, David shouted out, um, uh, Michael, slow down. Rome wasn't built in a day. And Michael, as he disappeared down the corridor, shouted back over his shoulder, yes, but Margaret wasn't the foreman on that job. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, this next story is, is, is not rem remotely true, but it shows how she was envisaged at the time. And uh, this was a skit that was on uh, TV, and um, uh, the scene is um, the Café Royale uh, in, in London, uh, where uh, in 1989, supposedly, um, Margaret's uh, senior advisers and entire cabinet uh, take her for dinner. And um, the, the, the scene is set with the Margaret at the head of the table and about 20 men in grey suits down this side and 20 men in grey suits down, down the other side. Uh, and the waiter comes in and he goes obviously straight to the Prime Minister, the only lady in the room. Uh, Prime Minister, would you like an appetizer? Prawn cocktail, please. Prime Minister, for your main course, uh, a steak, please. Prime Minister, what, what kind of steak? Oh, a sirloin, please. Uh, Prime Minister, how would you like it? I'd like it rare, please. Uh, Prime Minister, some potatoes. Yes, I'll take some uh, race, <coughs> roast potatoes, please. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, what about the vegetables? Oh, they'll all have steak, too. <laughs> That's how she was portrayed. Uh, but it's not true. It's not at all true. She was desperately worried about some of the big privatisations, um, that, that they were taking too much to, to market too fast. And she was very worried about the uh, giving local authority tenants the right to buy their homes. She thought that the great middle classes that had sweated to, to buy, to save and buy their homes might find it a bit unfair that these people in local authority housing were, were, get, were bringing 50% off, basically. Um, but mostly, that, that, that never happened. People thought it was quite fair that, if, in effect, they'd been renting for years, and people saw that as being sort of a rent to buy almost sort of notion. Um, but she, um, so she, she, she wasn't. And uh, although the, 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 the noun, was it Mark Twain said, I, I ne never met a, a noun I couldn't verb? Uh, well, the, the noun handbag uh, became a verb, 
because uh, she was supposed to handbag people, <laughs> I said, hit them over the head with a heavy handbag. And such became the, the myth uh, that uh, the Conservative Association chairman up and down the land were constantly writing, saying, you know, when, when, when your next handbag wears out, can we have it for auction? <laughs> <laughs> and they would go for thousands of pounds. Um, fourthly, she championed policies that went with the grain of human nature. The, the one I've already mentioned, or two I've already mentioned, uh, the, the privatisation of the commanding heights. They built all kinds of incentives in there. For example, the privatisation of British Airways. 25% of the stock was reserved for the staff and the pilots, and they were given a huge discount uh, to get people to buy in. Uh, and this is why individual stock ownership went from 7% to nearly 30%. Or the, the, the selling of the local authority housing. Um, for every extra year that you'd um, paid rent, you, you got an extra 1% off. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, well, fifthly, there was a lot of strategic thinking uh, well, uh, well ahead of time. Um, they, they'd learnt a lot from the mistakes of the Heath government, 70 to 74. Uh, for example, when the mine workers went on strike against Heath to bring Heath down, there was only about a month's worth of coal reserves at the, uh, at the electricity generating plants. Well, her first minister for energy, uh, clever Nigel Lawson immediately built those stocks up to a year. So that when the mine workers finally took Margaret on after her second victory in 83, uh, she could tough it out with them for a year because they had a year's worth of, of coal uh, stocked up. She had a um, six. She surrounded herself with a lot of very clever, very committed folks. The Tory party, when I first joined it in 1971 and first uh, took my first politics lecture, at the London School of Economics from a man called Bernard Donoghue, who'd worked for Harold Wilson and went on to work for Harold again. Um, he called the Tory party the stupid party. And um, there was a lot of merit in that observation because a lot of people in the Tory party in 71 were there because of birth and wealth and not necessarily because of, of merit. In fact, some of them were quite stupid. Um, but by the time Margaret became leader, that was changing and, and she helped that uh, 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 along. And a lot of the ideas um, that markets work, governments fail, labour market reform, privatisation, the conquering of inflation, were well worked out in that four-year. American pre incoming presidents don't have a four-year period like Margaret had. She was elected leader of her party in early 75 and came to power in the spring of 79. So she had a very long time to prepare. Um, seventh, she was helped enormously by the fact that there was a very much a a feeling that we were in the last chance saloon, uh, that if we didn't get it right this time, you know, boy, we were going to be, you know, another Argentina or, you know, whatever, you know, formerly prosperous top ten country, uh, <coughs> gone completely uh, uh, down, down the, um, the, the tubes. Uh, my predecessor as director of the Institute of Economic Affairs in London, Ralph Harris, uh, wrote an article in 1978 um, for the Sunday Telegraph, our leading uh, Sunday conservative paper and insisted that they put on the, the headline on it. Uh, normally, as an author, you, you don't decide the headline, and it's decided by some sub-editor, but he insisted on the headline because it linked very much to his theme, and the headline was, cheer up, things are getting worse. <laughs> uh, meaning that it's only when a country really faces a crisis. I was just seeing in Greece right now, you know, that, 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 that only when a country really faces a crisis. And you muddle along, you know, things aren't too bad, and there's not the appetite for change. Eighth, we mustn't forget her relationship with Ronald Reagan. Uh, they were incredibly close. They had met twice. Dennis Thatcher, in fact, spotted Ronald Reagan as a potential ally uh, at an Institute of Directors dinner and came running home um, uh, well before Reagan became president and said, uh, Margaret, you'd love this guy. He's absolutely you know, right up your street. And uh, a meeting was arranged for an hour, and they chatted for three hours. And when he came back through London and two or three years later, again, a, a meeting for an hour was arranged and it ran over to three hours. Uh, and so they were very close. And we have to remember, of course, that she became prime minister during the Carter era. And she was prime minister right through the Reagan era and didn't go till a couple of years into the George Bush the first. Um, so um, she, she was Ronald's uh, ally um, throughout. And really only once, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, 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 the United States invaded Grenada. Grenada. 
Um, thank you, Father. Um, uh, only once uh, did she uh, fall out with him, and he put her on speakerphone in the middle of a cabinet meeting in the White House, and she just roasted him for 20 minutes. <laughs> because of course, Great Nader is British, and his excuse uh, was that uh, he'd been advised that if he tipped her off beforehand, uh, that the, the Foreign Office, our, our kind of left of centre Foreign Office, would have, would have leaked it. And, um, uh, and she wasn't informed for, the, for that reason. But apart from that one uh, thing, they got on famously. Um, ninth, I really mentioned this already in, in, in a sense, in that um, th that four years of, of preparation, that time to prepare. And tenth, she didn't try to do it all at once. Um, for example, on the privatizations, the 30 great privatizations, there were two or three a year, maybe four or five at the peak. Um, uh, on the labor market reforms that uh, brought the trade unions back under the control of the members rather than the extremists, uh, she had a, um, an employment act every two years, uh, just slicing away at, 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 the, um, at, at the issues and brought them back under the rule of law. So my ten lessons are um, have a s strong compass, uh, simplify and communicate, lead but always listen, develop policies that go with the grain, think through your strategy ahead of time, build good teams, use circumstances, make good allies, prepare, prepare before you're in power, uh, and have um, patience. Uh, in my book, I go into what a modern-day Thatcher would have to do. Um, <coughs> But um, that's a rather British uh, s section, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. H how do we rate her today? Well, the leftist um, BBC, which do, in mo some of you probably think that stands for British Broadcasting Corporation. It, it doesn't. It stands for Big Bunch of Commies. <laughs> 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 they actually rated her as the 16th greatest ever uh, greatest ever Britain. It's not bad for the BBC to rate you as sixth, you know, top 20 in all of history. Charles Moore, who is one of our most distinguished newspaper editors and journalists, uh, recently wrote, uh, with all due respect to Her Majesty the Queen, uh, Margaret Thatcher is the greatest living Englishwoman. And one of our most distinguished historians, Francis Beckett, has just written a, a history of the, um, the... We have 20 prime ministers in the 20th century, which is a neat statistic. And um, he recently wrote a book ranking them. Now, I'm sure you can all guess who came in the 20th. Oh, dear. Chamberlain. Yes, well done, sir. <laughs> I once did that trick at, at uh, the Northwood University campus, not, not here in Midland, but down in uh, Florida. I did that trick with, with students during the afternoon and with the faculty at, at dinner, and the students got it and the faculty didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I won't bore you with all of them. Well, maybe I should. Maybe I should just run up the list, um, starting with, with 20th, and I'll slow down as we get to the top. But Chamberlain, Anthony Eden, John Major, Alec Douglas Hume, Ramsay MacDonald, Bona Law, Balfour, Callaghan, Tony Blair at 12th, uh, Harold Wilson, Stanley Baldwin, David Lloyd George, Herbert Asquith, Lord Salisbury, Campbell Bannerman, fifth, Harold Macmillan, fourth, Winston Churchill, third, Edward Heath, I guess because of uh, Europe, uh, second, Clement Attlee, because of uh, his nationalizations and post-World War II, first, Margaret Thatcher. 